we'll get on with our study here. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Starting with verse 16. Romans 1.16 is where it starts. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, Gentiles. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, or be from faith at the point of salvation, to the experiential faith of reaching spiritual maturity. And it, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth un, in unrighteousness. I would un, underline that to really emphasize it. They know the truth, but they suppress it in unrighteousness. Verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them. Within them. For God made it evident to them. And where we're going to pick up tonight is in shortly in verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so they are without excuse. And that's where we're going to head towards, but right now we are completing the portion of verse 19. I'll put it in the, on the board for you. Here's Romans 19, because that which is known about God is evident in them, for God has made it evident to them. There's no ambiguity there. Anyone can see that what God wants mankind to know about him, he has revealed it to them. In fact, he has made sure it is evident within them, and we saw that that has a lot to do with gospel hearing and, well, mainly God consciousness. That's what, we're, that's what this is mainly uh, looking at. This is a quote by R.B. Theme Jr. in Romans chapter 1. Negative volition at the point of gospel hearing means maladjustment to the justice of God at salvation. Maladjustment to the Justice of God uh, at gospel hearing means means the unbeliever unbeliever re re reversionism in time and divine judgment in eternity in lake of fire. That first part should be negative volition at the point of uh, God consciousness. So I didn't know. I'm glad I went back here. I'll change that. So if you, if you have your notes, you want to change that uh, as well. So there's two points where there can be maladjustment to God's justice, meaning rejecting God's plan. And first of is when is God's, is uh, at the time that you are God, at God consciousness, and we saw that every person comes to that unless you are inhibited by some kind of mental incapacity. Every normal person reaches God consciousness, and God has given us volition and he holds us accountable for what we do with it when we reach God consciousness. We can either respond to what we see in creation, knowing that man couldn't do, couldn't create this. It has to be God. And if there's a God, then we are certainly accountable to him. They can either respond to it that way and 
go on to gospel hearing, and they could, they could be negative at gospel hearing, but if they're positive at both of these junctures, then of course they are born again, they receive the gospel, and they're eternally saved. Isn't that something? I just happened to stop there, and I'm, I'm not going to take the time to change that now, but it should be negative volition at the point of, of um, God consciousness is what it should be. I'll change that. Okay, now it's froze. There it goes. Okay, let's get down to our lesson for tonight. No one can ever legitimately claim that God has not revealed himself to them, and anyone who makes that claim is confused and misinformed. No one can claim that. Psalm 98 verse 2 says, The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 45, verse 20. It's, a, it's fairly long, so I just will turn to it. Isaiah 45 is one of my favorite chapters in Isaiah. I have done this before, but I'm going to do it again for you uh, just to make the point known. Turn first of all to Isaiah 44, 4. You're at Isaiah 44, 4. Go to verse 6. Isaiah 44, 6. And the last sentence there, the last part of that verse says, And there is no God besides me. Highlight that some way. Mark it. Then drop down to verse 8. Right towards the bottom in verse 8 of Isaiah 44. Is there any gods beside me, or is there any other rock? Of course, then, that's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. Turn to verse 21. Well, not, not, not 21, that's something else. Go to Isaiah 45 now and turn to verse 5. Isaiah 45, 5. I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me there is no God. Go to verse 6, the next verse. The last sentence. I am the Lord and there is no other. Go to verse 14. God is with you and there is none else. No other God. Verse 18. Last part. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Go down to verse 21. Down towards the bottom. And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none except me. Verse 22. For I am God, and there is no other. Chapter 46, verse 9. Remember before the, the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Do you get the point? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so let's go to, I just wanted to point that out because I have that highlighted in yellow, all those places. And when you highlight it like this and you go through there, he's really making a point. But we're going to look at verse 20 through 23. Isaiah 45, verses 20 through 23. Now what we're concentrating on is really what was said in verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. And so now we've, we've already gone to Psalm 92, where he has made known and has revealed his righteousness in the sight of nations. Now, in Isaiah 45, he is, this is a challenge. He is uh, talking about those, <clears throat> excuse me, 
who are idolaters, and he's challenging them. Verse 20 says, Gather yourselves and come. Draw near together, you fugitives of the nations. They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idol and pray to a God who cannot save. Verse 21, Declare and set forth your case. What he's saying is, okay, you're idolaters and you're worshiping wood and metal and uh, idols. Make your case for that. Indeed, let them consult together who has announced this from old. Who has long since declared it? He's talking about they have no case. And he's, he's, he's asking the question, who's the one that announced this from old, that they have no case? Who has long since declared it? Announce, declared. You see those words in there? Is it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me. A righteous God and a Savior, there is none except me. Verse 22. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. In other words, he keeps saying this because they are worshiping other gods, idols. He said, there is no other. Verse 23, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness. So we had the, the words like, he announced this in verse 21. He has announced, and then he, uh, he has long since declared it. And now in verse 23, I have sworn by myself through the word that has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness. This, this is God making known of who he is and his righteousness. It carries on and says, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back that to me every knee will bow and every tongue will confess or swear, swear allegiance. So what he's, of course, he's talking about what's going to happen in the millennium there. But I wanted to show you how throughout the Bible he has announced, he has declared, he has said it through his mouth who he is. He is the righteous one. Okay, let's go back to Romans. And now in Romans chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, I'll wait for y'all to get there. This is very, very meaningful to me because it is these, these few verses here that in Romans chapter 10 that motivated me to teach the star series. These very words right here. So in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it starts out saying, and you probably all have heard this verse before, it's a very famous verse. So faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. Now he's going to play the straw man here. And he says, but I say, surely they have never heard, have they? So he's saying faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ or from the word of God. And he's making the case of what they have been making already. But I say, surely they have never heard, have they? And he, then he answers and says, indeed they have. So earlier on, well, in, in chapter 10, they are talking about calling unto the Lord. And in verse 14, they say, it says, and then they shall call upon him in whom they have not believed. And how shall they believe in him who they have not heard? Are y'all with me? Are you looking at verse 14? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So they haven't heard. They can't know the truth unless they have heard. And how can they hear without a preacher? Verse 15, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? The preachers are sent. Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. That's a quote. Now in verse 16, However, they did not all heed the glad tidings, for Isaiah says, 
Lord, who has believed our report? So it's going kind of going back and forth. They're trying to make a case. It's not their fault. They didn't hurt. There's no way they, they, they can know because it takes a preacher. And then they say, well, no, they have heard, but uh, they didn't believe it. That's what he's saying in, in uh, verse 16. They did hear, he, they heard the glad tidings, but they didn't heed the glad tidings. Now in verse 17 is where we get back to where I started. He says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. He says, but I say they have never heard, have they? And now he says, indeed they have. He's making the case that they have heard. And then he says, and let me get this up where people can see it. He says, their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. What is he talking about here? Well, let's go to Psalm 19. Put a marker here in Romans. He says, Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. What is he talking about? We'll see right here. This is one of my favorite psalms. It's a short one. I'm not going to read the whole psalm, but... Psalm 19, that's where we're going. Now he is, what he's done is quote Psalm 19.4, but we're going to start with Psalm 19.1, okay? Psalm 19.1, for the choir director, a Psalm of David. David wrote this. Psalm 19.1. The heavens are declaring or telling of the glory of God. And that is, uh, our telling is the Hebrew kafar, C-A-P-H-A-R. It's a P-L uh, participle, which is meaning continue, continuing action. C-A-P-H-A-R in the Hebrew and it means continue action. So the heavens continue telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Now this is what Paul quoted, verse 4. Their line, meaning their sound, has gone through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun. And he starts talking about the sun here. What he's talking about here are the stars. He says the heavens, including the stars, which we see as constellations, are putting out not words that you can tell, but there is a message there, and they are describing and telling about the righteousness and justice and the glory and love and the salvation. All of that is in the stars. And so he concludes, which what is well how we conclude verse 20, is that they are without excuse. You see, there was a long period before there was any writing. Everything was done by word of mouth. I think Adam was versed in the God's message in the stars, and he passed it on and passed it on and passed it on. They didn't have electric light like we have now. And so every night they would go up and look at the sky, and all the stars are numbered and they're named by God. And there are untold billions, quadrillions of them. And God didn't just throw them out there and say, isn't that pretty? As the constellations pass by into our sight, there is a message there. And I have on, on, on our website, God's message in the stars. The reason I'm telling you that, because even if everything else failed, they can't say that God didn't get his message across. 
He did it in a big way. And the only way that could reach the people and the only one that could do it was God. So I thought that was really impressive. It was impressive to me. So we have natural revelation, which is God's creation, the earth itself. And we have special revelation, which is his word. But he also, we also have the stars. God went to that trouble. To him, it's no trouble. But he went to that extent to make sure that we would know that he is just and righteous and we are not. And we are accountable to him for the manifestation of his wrath is really demonstrating his righteousness and justice. We have a problem. We're not righteous and he is. And he will not stand for unrighteousness. Of course, when you go further, you recognize that he provided the redemption solution to people who are unrighteous, which is every one of us. That's up there in the stars as well. So anyway, I thought I would show you that. That is, uh, most people don't know that. They read this, they don't know what Psalm 19, that's a quote from Psalm 19, and their line, their, their sound, even though it's silent, goes throughout the earth. Now what I'm doing here is demonstrating what we saw in Romans chapter 1 verse 19 that he has informed us, let's go to it again right here, because that which is known about God is evident within them. That's talking about God consciousness. In other words, when, a, when someone reaches the age where they're not a child anymore, and they look at God's creation, and they know some superior being did this. Man cannot do this. And then God will hold them accountable as to what they do with that knowledge. But every one of them has that knowledge. All of us have. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 and 18 says, So by faith comes the, so faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Verse 18, But I say, Surely they have not heard, have they? Indeed they have. Their voice has gone into all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. There it is in Scripture. Romans chapter 3, verse 21 and 22 says this, But now apart from the law... The righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. I put in red here, being manifested and witnessed. All these have to do with God getting the knowledge out to all mankind about who he is. What is he about? Verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile. doesn't matter what color you are or what language you speak. God has manifested his righteousness and his characteristics. What is he like? Is all embodied in what he has created. In the most elementary of human terms, this is not a case of a father who chastens his teenager for something he never even told him to do. That's what some people claim. Well, how do we, how are we to submit to God? We don't know anything about him. That's not true. It's not like a teenager who's going to be <clears throat> in trouble for something he was never told to do. Rather, this is where I am right here, rather, this is a case of a teenager leaving school and all the way home, seeing billboards, street signs, flashing marquees, marquees, signs on buses, bumper stickers, airplanes pulling message banners. Billy, don't forget to set the garbage out for the trash truck. Then when he gets home, there are phone messages, email messages, and television commercials reminding him of the same thing. That is how plainly God has made knowledge of himself available to the human race. I believe even I could get that. 
I think the planes pulling the banners would be the one that would get me. God in his creation has provided sufficient evidence of himself to hold accountable all who reject that revelation. What can be known of God is perfectly clear. God himself made it plain. Theologians call this natural revelation. It's natural. It's, it's his creation as distinguished from special revelation. To demand some sort of absolute proof of God's existence is simply an indication of the recalcitrant nature of fallen humanity. It, it, it always amazes me when you're talking to somebody about God and they say, well, I don't know if I believe in a supreme being or not. And I, I look at it, really? How can, how can you not see it? All you have to do is open your eyes. It's, the evidence is everywhere. Even you, yourself. The fact that you can talk, you can hear, your eyes can see all the phenomenal things that God has done, and you're saying you need evidence? Even a blind man could know about God from what he has created, including ourselves. So this is the end product of Romans 1.19. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, God consciousness, for God made it evident to them. And now we get to Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made, so they are without excuse. This changes everything, doesn't it? When you're talking to an unbeliever, he's asking like, acting like, well, there's no proof about God. If God would just speak to me, if he would do a miracle, if he would do this, he would do that. Nonsense. They have already reached God consciousness and if they're saying those kind of things, they probably were negative at God consciousness. And if you are there explaining to them that through his creation, you can realize what God is all about. Not all about, but you can, you can realize a lot about him, specifically his attributes and his power. There is a God and we're not him. And we are held accountable to him. And so many of these people who hear you saying that God is all-powerful, created the universe, but they need evidence. The evidence is all around them. So let's look. This verse is very interesting because it says, from the beginning, God has clearly revealed the things about himself that man can understand. He made it so. Atheists and agnostics reject this verse and condemn themselves in doing so. What does God have to say about them? Psalm 53, 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And the, the Hebrew word there for fool is more like insanity. You have to be insane not to believe that God exists. And of course, the atheists don't believe there's a God, and the agnostic doesn't know one way or the other. And most of the time it's because they demand more evidence. The universe, the heavens, the earth, and everything on it is not enough evidence for them. So... <clears throat> For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes. What is this about invisible attributes? The word attributes is not found in the Greek. It's not there. Most Bibles insert the word attributes, which is fine, but qualities, characteristics, or essence could be used as well. It's describing something about the person of God. 
These words are intangible, meaning they have no physical presence. They cannot be touched or seen. Just as God cannot be seen, neither can these words. So we use words all the time that you can't describe. For instance, we have the word characteristics. What color is that? What does it smell like? What does it look like? We don't know, does do we? It's, we use words to describe people or things that are intangible. And yet people say, I, wouldn't, I won't believe God unless I can see him. And yet yeah, you use words all the time that you can't see. So we see the invisible God through faith. That's the important point. We don't have to see him. In fact, no man has seen God and lived. Jesus Christ is the only member of the Godhead that is visible right now. We will see him. But we see them through their attributes, their characteristics. Let me put it this way. You can tell a lot by an artist. But how can you tell something about an artist? Well, well, by what he sculpts or paints or whatever it is. Uh, what's the guy that got his ear cut off? Uh, Van Gogh. Van Gogh, was, there was something wrong. Have you ever seen his art? He'd show a person, the head is over here, and I'll, you know, it's, it's just crazy. And he was crazy. So you can tell something about what people create that says something about their person. And we can't see God, but we can see what he created, and we can tell quite a bit about him because of that. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27 says, By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. It's talking about Moses. How, how could he see that which was unseen? Through faith. The invisible God is now seen in, first of all, physical creation. That's what this verse is about. Scripture. And ultimately, in Jesus Christ. We don't see him now, but we will. He's coming back. And we will see him as he is. We went up to the Mount of Transfiguration and he showed a few of his disciples what he looked like. They said, it says it's like looking at the sun. Go outside on a hot summer day. No clouds and just look up at the, at the sun. I guess the compared to that, the Disciples probably look like a candle. We all would look like a candle compared to that. So we will see Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? I have no idea what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm just, I'm just going. To, the only thing that comes to mind is I'm just going to do what most people saw do when they saw an angel, and that's just hit the ground. Aren't you looking forward to that? Not only are we going to see him, but all of our loved ones who have already gone on, we're going to see them too. Can you imagine what kind of reunion that's going to be? And we're going to be going vertical, leaving this veil of tears, headed for heaven. Those are the things we need to think about when we are afraid or when we're down in the dumps or things are getting to us. The things that are yet ahead are so wonderful even God's word itself can't explain them to where we can have an, even have an inkling of how wonderful it's going to be. Now, often people write a resume to give to employers to let them know something about themselves and what they have accomplished. The first thing on God's resume is that he created the heavens and the earth. That's essentially what he's done. His resume is first... Well, okay, God, we want to know something about you. Tell, just give us an example. 
Well, I created the heavens and the earth out of nothing. You're hired. <laughs> I know that's kind of hokey, but I thought it might make a good illustration anyway. Although God is essentially invisible, his qualities are mirrored in the great things he has created. We can tell a lot about God by observing the earth he created again out of nothing. You've heard, of, I'm shameless for saying this, but you've heard of the joke about uh, Satan challenged God to see who could make the biggest uh, castle out of sand on the beach. And God said, okay, Satan, you go first. So he goes over and he says, okay, I need some sand. He's over there getting sand. God said, uh-uh, you use your own sand that you have to create out, create out of nothing. Something like that. The phenomenal detail and beauty in fish, flowers, birds, insects, and animals. I'm not going to rush this. I, I've seen videos, and you probably have too, of the phenomenal earth. You're flying over and you see the waves. You see the, the uh, eagles grab a salmon out of the lake and just the beautiful things. And the re one reason I put the beauty in fish, even a red fish or a speckled trout, they're beautiful. But Carrie and I had the honor of going down to Cancun one time, and we went snorkeling. Ah, blown away. These, these fish were so detailed. Some of them looked like violet. Uh, one of them were pretty, freaked me out. He had teeth just like us. Is it called a rockfish? He would eat on the rock, and he, he like if he smiled, he had those teeth. I said, "Oh man!" But he was beautiful all the same. If you've ever been in a place like that, you'll never forget it. Those fish. Now God could have just made them all gray and not put any color into them, no specific. And ever the shapes, the forms are. Uh, uh, to this day, I just relish the time that we had. Just taking our time, and, and these fish would go, come up to us, all those different ones, just fantastic. Flowers, of course, you know. Well, these flowers are, how old are they? Two A week? Oh, about a week old. They still look pretty good. But, but when they were, you know, a week ago, they were just phenomenal. And God just takes those and scatters all over, all over the earth. You can go in the darkest of Africa where nobody even has gone or has been in a long time, and these beautiful flowers are everywhere. Birds. Oh, man. We have a bird uh, feeder outside our house. We haven't put any feed in it for a while now, but uh, it will bring birds. And just even a red bird or a... Uh, what is that, painted bunting? You're just in awe of it, of all the detail and colors and shapes and so forth. And today, this very day, I went over and there was a, a, a our pear tree and there was a bird nest on the ground. No, nothing in it, just a bird nest. And I was looking at that and I thought, what a phenomenal thing. Most people would think, well, what's a bird feed, uh, a bird nest? Which is just a nest. I'd like to see you make one with your mouth. Let me see you make a bird nest out of your mouth with your beak. <laughs> I mean, it's all woven and they have to get the right size twigs and they have to gather it up and how do they start to even st do it? And every one of them does it. They know how to do it because God put it in them. Phenomenal. Insects. Now, I'm not a fan of insects. <clears throat> but you know these dragonflies? <clears throat> I guess they're insects, right? I saw the one the other day. I've never seen one like it. It had the coloring on it. It, it, it had these wings coming out, and it was clear, and then it had a, a kind of a blue box here, another space, and another, another blue box, and then a couple of, of just stripes. And, of course, the other one was exactly the same. And I can't even begin to uh, explain it, but I was just I was just taken. I said, 
God is so, he, he, he is so m marvelous that there's no detail, there's nothing he can't do, of course. So he can have an insect. And I might have been the only person that will ever see that insect, that, that dragonfly. But boy, did it make an impression upon me. And I was thinking about him. Don't you know that that's one reason he did it that way? What if everything was gray? No colors. He could have made it that way. And fish all look like croakers. Now, croakers are okay fish, but I mean, let's face it, they're on the bottom of the barrel there. The fish barrel. <laughs> and animals. How about animals? I, I think of I think of the most magnificent animals I ever saw in person, up close, at the zoo, was a tiger. He looked like he was eight foot long. Huge head. And his eyes, his whiskers must have been this long. And, you know, all the stripes. And I was, I was just in awe. Uh, and I was keeping my distance. Can you imagine the ingenuity to start with nothing and create a tiger? A lot of people have died because they got a little too close to a tiger because they were so beautiful. I said I wasn't going to rush this, so I'm going I'm to stay to my word here. The majesty and beauty of mountains, canyons, oceans, lakes, and clouds. Rainbows and sunrises and sunsets. He created all this. I mean, I've gone to places and just saw mountains and I was just, the massive majesty of these mountains. I've never been to the Grand Canyon, but here it's a pretty big ditch. And we're seeing I have seen the ocean, lakes, trees. Just think about trees. Can any, how would you go about making a tree if you didn't have a seed? And the idea of how it's, it, I look at trees and I see, we have a big oak tree at our house. It's you know huge, big, at least this big, maybe three feet around, I mean, in diameter maybe. And as I look, it's, it's amazing to me how as it goes up and goes further away from the tree, it gets smaller and smaller till you get out to the end of the limb and it's a little bitty twig out there. And it has to be structured exactly right so that the limbs coming out from the trunk are big enough to hold what's going to be going out there. We have a tree in our backyard and it's probably from the tree to our, where our deck is, it's probably at least 25, maybe 30 feet. And I'm looking at a little twig right here in my face at the, on the deck. The tree's 25 or 30 feet away. I mean, we need to stop, slow down, and just take stock of what God has created. And I'm a, I'm a kind of a cloud fan. Um, of course, rainbows, who doesn't write a, like a rainbow? And I, I'm still really perturbed about the LGBT uh, stealing the rainbow. That was Satan's doing for sure. Because that's a phenomenal thing to start with and it's a promise from God. But anyway, I'm not letting that in any way detract from a rainbow. Can you, can you have a beautiful rainbow like that and not look at it? And sunrises and sunsets. I live in a place where I have a really nice view of sunsets. I have... And I take pictures with my camera of the sunsets. And I, I probably have about 150, mostly sunsets. There's a few sunrises, but most of them sunsets. And it's just what, it's like the sky is a palette. And not every day, but several times, it's like he says, okay, watch what I'm going to do today. You've seen them before. The whole sky is red. You, you, there's no way that somebody with a brush and paint can capture that. It's just like when I went to Cal, uh, to uh, Colorado, and I was up and on the top peak. I think it was in Winter Park, and uh, 
also is that where's that place? Keystone as well. And I was just amazed and I got a camera and took a picture of it. And then when I looked at it, it looked like nothing. The spectacular ongoing show that the moon, stars, and planets put on each night and the magnificent sun that warms us and gives life to plants and trees. So, that's, when I taught the star series, what happens, of course we live in cities and nobody has time to go outside and look at anything. But every night there is a new show because as the world turns like this, it just sees another panorama of the constellations and God's message in the stars. And of course you have the beautiful, the stars in themselves. We just think of a twinkle, twinkle little star. Oh, mercy. They're different colors, they're different shapes. They're absolutely beautiful. And the planets. I, a lot of times I'll go outside and I'll see a planet up there and I say, what star is that? Oh, is it so-and-so? I said, no, that's a trick question, that's a planet. You, we, I have a telescope and I can see the rings around Saturn. I can see the red dot on Jupiter. And, and they put on a show every night for us. Everything is interconnected, mutually joined and dependent, and it all operates the way he designed in perfect balance and harmony. And how can somebody see all of that? and say there is no God. Those people are held accountable for that ridiculous idea. So if you ever run into an atheist or agnostic or somebody just says, I don't believe there's God or I'm not sure or whatever, anything else, you need to talk to them with the cognizant facts in your mind that you know that they have been informed about who God is. The scriptures are telling us this. We didn't get to it t today, but we will next time. This verse ends, they are without excuse. The evidence is overwhelming. And they don't want to be held accountable so they pretend there is no God and this, I, this stupid, asinine idea about Evolution. You know that they don't even believe that. Scientists don't even believe that anymore. Very few still adhere to that, and yet they're still teaching it in the schools. Of course, that was from Satan as well. Well, I'm so happy that I got to the end of that. It, it, I, all I was doing is, is going through my own mind and thinking about the beautiful things that I've seen right in my own yard in a few places that I have gone out where I could see tropical fish and the beauty and the design is just so overwhelming. We can see his eternal power and his attributes from what he has created. We'll continue this next time. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you are who you are and that you are so awesome in what you have created. Even man in his selfishness and his sinful state has marred your creation in several ways. It is still absolutely spectacular. And we are so thankful that you created it the way you did. And all these years... It has gone on. We don't have to maintain it. It maintains itself. The water system of the clouds falling on the land and rubbing back out into the ocean and it just keeps revolving, it just keeps that system going. Our lives depend on that and we don't ever even think about it and we don't give you glory for it, but we should. We pray that you will help us to have great a, a, a great, greater sense of appreciation just for your creation and what you have done to sustain us and how beautiful and magnificent that it is. You get all the glory. 
because you are God and there is no other. We thank you for this. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.